The events described in this story occurred at different times for different members of the same family. I met this family and convinced them to tell me their story. This strange incident happened with four members of this family. Hello, my name is Harrison, and I am conducting research on paranormal incidents. I want to become a paranormal investigator in the future, and I am currently preparing for that. I take notes on paranormal activity that occurs around me, and I discuss strange occurrences with people in the hopes that this will help me become a paranormal investigator in the future. So I met a family today who informed me about a paranormal event that happened to them recently, and I decided to start a record of these occurrences. Let's figure out what happened to them. Mr. Williams lives in this house with his wife and two children. Their older son, Colton, is 15 years old, and their younger son, Nicole, is 12 years old. Nicole, the house's youngest and brightest member, describes what happened to him as follows. We bought this house six years ago, and after a few months, strange things began to happen in this house. As a result, household items began to deteriorate. First, the TV was damaged, then the fridge, and finally, the air conditioner. As a result, other things in the house started to fail. Everyone was surprised to know why all of these things were happening in the house. Then I went to bed in my room one night. I dozed for a while. Right at that moment, I became aware of the sound of someone strolling in the upstairs room using loud, heavy footsteps. Thack, 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 thack. I was thinking that since no one goes upstairs, where is this sound coming from? I told everyone in my house about it the next morning, but no one paid attention. Hearing this, I began to believe that something similar had occurred, and I went back to sleep in my room that night. Around 2.30 a.m., I felt as if someone had climbed onto my bed. I opened my eyes and looked around, but no one was there. I then realized it was a dream and fell back asleep. A few days later, some of my relatives visited us for the holidays. They also had two children the same age as me. After dinner, all of the kids came to my room and began scaring each other by telling ghost witch stories. One of them, Archie, declared that he was not afraid of ghosts and began boasting in this manner. Dean, Archie's elder brother, stated that if he was not afraid, he would go alone into another room where a small night bulb was torching. Archie said, what's the big deal about this? I'm going now. Archie went to that room and then ran out of it very quickly. We saw him walk out. We burst out laughing and began making fun of him. Then Archie began to cry and became completely drenched in sweat. I was so puzzled by everything that I asked him what had happened. He trembled and said, I saw a man there who was wrapped in a black blanket, and he was leaning as he walked. Telling this, he started crying louder, but I managed to calm him down and get everyone back into the game. After a while of playing, everyone fell asleep. But everything that happened to me and Archie was going through my head. I went to the balcony to think about all of this. When I looked down, I saw the same man that Archie had told me about. He was slowly approaching our car, and then, as he got close, he suddenly disappeared. After this incident, I became scared and began sleeping with my father. For a few days, everything was fine. I didn't hear any footsteps and never saw that man again. I assumed everything was fine, but I was mistaken. Because such incidents began to occur with my elder brother, Jackson. This was Nicole's story. Let us now hear what happened to Jackson. He described the incidents that occurred to him in this manner. My family members slept inside the room while I slept on the couch outside in the hall. I couldn't sleep despite my best efforts, so I started walking around the house like this. While walking, my gaze was drawn to the main gate, and I had the impression that someone was standing outside it. I went to the gate to look, but no one was there, so I went back to sleep. The next day around 3 p.m., I went to the second floor for some work. As I was walking, I felt like someone was following me. I looked back two or three times, but no one was there. I heard something falling from behind as I was going downstairs. I looked back and saw a black shadow on the wall in front of me, and she vanished as soon as I saw it. I jumped in terror and sprinted downstairs. I spent the following night sleeping in the hallway. In the middle of the night, my eyes opened unexpectedly. 
And seeing what was in front of me, my condition had reached a point where nothing was coming out of my mouth. I tried to scream, but couldn't even if I wanted to. Her face was so horrifying that anyone with a weak heart would die just by looking at her. Her tattered black clothes and hair were slowly flying through the air, and she was about a foot above the ground and staring at me. I began to read my prayers in my head, but my prayers had no effect on it. She stared at me for two or three minutes, then went up the stairs, and I had no idea when I fainted. The next morning, I woke up and immediately rushed to tell my mother everything that had happened. Nicole also arrived and stated that there is something wrong in this house, and I also saw a man dressed in black and heard someone walking in the night. After hearing this, mother was convinced that if both of them are saying this, then something is seriously wrong. The next day, the mother called a priest from the church and told him everything and asked him to purify the house, which the priest did by going around the entire house and purifying it with holy water. While I was sleeping that night, someone picked me up from the sofa and slammed me on the ground so hard that I broke my straight arm. To the sound of my screams, my entire family woke and began asking what had happened. Someone slammed me down hard and broke my arm. I cried. All of the family members were terrified after witnessing this. And the next day, we went to our uncle's house and told them everything. He said, You stay here for a few days, and we'll figure out what to do after that. The first two days went well, but on the third day, something happened that I can't believe could ever happen. This was Jackson's claim. Let's hear what happened on the third day which was hard to believe and told by Nicole and Jackson's mother in this manner. There was no one at the house on the third day as I sat on the sofa watching TV. I felt as if someone was sitting by my side while watching TV and when I looked to the side, my senses were blown away. A man and a woman dressed in black sat beside me. I couldn't move or speak and both of them were frighteningly smiling at me. Then they both got up and went to the kitchen not knowing where they were going from there. When my husband came back home from work that night, I told him everything, and we all became upset once more that such incidents occur here as well. Everyone else had slept through the night, but I couldn't. I began to worry more about the children than myself, that they should never see anything like this again. When I woke up at 1 o'clock a.m., I smelled gas and suspected that it was leaking. I went to the kitchen to investigate. Everything looked normal when I arrived, but as I turned to head back to my room, I heard a voice call out to me from behind. I turned the phone back and saw that no one was there. I dashed to my room because I hadn't gotten any sleep that night. The next morning, I told my husband, we should do something. What is going on? He stated that I would be going home today with a priest. Mr. Williams invited a learned priest to his home, and he related everything that happened up to this point. After arriving at his residence, the priest stepped inside one of the rooms to check on something. After looking around the entire house, the priest concluded that there are two different kinds of demonic powers living here. Husband and wife and the soul of a small child wonders who died in this place many years ago. But my concern is that two demonic powers, only they can harm your family. There is nothing to be afraid of others. When I heard this, I was terrified and asked the priest to help me solve the problem. The priest stated, I will come after I finish my special worship. Until then, I will give an amulet to your family. This amulet will guard your loved ones from harm. Those souls will be visible to you, but they will not be able to harm you. The priest told me that in order to combat these evil spirits, I will need to make some necessary preparations. I returned to my family, gave the amulets to everyone, and told my wife everything the priest said. After a few days, the priest had finished his special worship and I took him back to my place once more. The priest retrieved a small pitcher. He started a fire and put something strange in it and a strange smell spread throughout the house. He then sat down on the ground and took five lemons. After reciting the mantra, he continued to place each lemon in a bag in turn. Every time the priest uttered the mantra, those of us there began to feel a peculiar restlessness, and our bodies felt heavy. The priest declared that there is no longer any cause for concern when he had finished placing all of the lemons in the bag. Put these lemons in a location where they can't be reached by anyone. Then he left. Then I threw those lemons in a nearby canal and went home. 
As the filth subsided, the atmosphere of the house became lighter, and it appeared as if there was so much peace in the house. That evening, I called my family. Nothing like this has ever happened in the house since that day. Here is the strange thing that happened to Mr. Williams' family. I had to document a number of similar incidents that occurred with the various people in various locations. Stay tuned with me. My name is Harrison, and you probably already know about me. I'm a paranormal investigator that looks into all these strange and eerie occurrences that are happening all around us. I recently spoke with Mr. William and his family, and they told me that ever since they moved into their new home, they had been plagued with demonic spirits in their home. However, since they had it treated by the church, they no longer feel anything like this in their home, and they are now living happily in their new home. After questioning him, I was driving to my house through a road when a man suddenly appeared in front of my car. My car brakes were applied in time, so I'm not sure what would have happened. Then I got out of my car and went to that man, but it appeared as if he had just had a large shock, after which that man is not in his senses, and as a result, he did not even realize he was in the midst of a moving road. Sir, are you okay? I inquired of the man. It appears as though my question had no impact on him, and that even my voice was inaudible to him. Sir, can, can you hear my voice? I asked the man as I once more bowed to him. Are you all right? It's as if my voice has reached that man's ear, and upon hearing it, he turns to face me. Looking into his eyes, it appeared as if he had sobbed a lot, causing the color of his eyes to lighten. Seeing this, I was convinced that something terrible had occurred to that man, causing him to be in such a state. The man began crying loudly as soon as he saw me and sat on the road as if the power had gone out of his feet. Seeing this, I wanted to help that man, but we were in the middle of the road, so first and foremost, I had to keep him and myself safe. So I somehow loaded him into my car and began driving on one side of the road. After safely parking the car on one side of the road, I asked the man, Sir, are you all right now? What happened to you? And if you don't mind sharing your point with me, could I be of some assistance to you? The man was still crying as if he wanted to take out his sadness by crying, but he couldn't. After a moment of crying, the man calmed himself and began speaking in a panic. I have to hurry to my house. I have to save my daughter, lest she kill my daughter as well. The man got out of my car and began sprinting. When I saw this, I jumped out of the car and raced after the man to stop him since I knew he was still in shock and had no idea what he was doing. Wait, you're putting yourself in danger by doing this, I said as I instantly halted the man. I don't know what occurred to you to cause you to be in such a state, but how will you save your daughter if you're acting in such a panic? After listening to me, the man came to his senses and began telling me what had happened to him. Seeing that man in this state, I told him once more. What happened to you that you are so concerned about and what is the risk to your daughter? And she will kill your daughter? Why did you say that? Has she previously murdered someone in your home? Who is this lady? Is it possible to enlist the assistance of the police in this case or is it something else? Hearing my questions, the man tells me his story. Benjamin is a cab driver by trade and lives with his family outside of town. Amelia is his wife's name. Ava is their oldest daughter and Lucas is their son. Emilio was fine the rest of the day when he went to work and the kids went to school. However, when her kids got home from school in the afternoon, they both noticed that their mom is looking a little more beautiful today. When I got home from work in the evening, I also noticed that my wife had changed. Wow. Everything in my house began to change the next day. Happiness began to pour in. A large sum of money began to arrive. We suddenly began finding buried treasure in the earth near our house. And my wife Amelia first revealed these riches to me while digging to cultivate vegetables in a nearby field. And then we discovered the buried treasure for the first time. After that, we began moving the valuables buried in the field from one location to another. I couldn't believe how much money was flooding in. After all of this, I quit my cab driver job and began enjoying all of these things. There was no need for me to work today because I had so much money and had enrolled my children in a large school to study. 
Everything was fine until one night when unusual and strange things began to happen in our lives. When we woke in the morning, we discovered that my younger son Lucas was missing from the house. Despite extensive searches, we were unable to find him. How could my kid go out alone at night when he was so young and always picked us up when he had to go somewhere at night? No one could come from the outside and sneak into our house and take him away. If he left then, then where did he leave? We informed the police and the police immediately began their investigation. In the midst of all this though, I noticed that despite my concern for my son, my wife Amelia acted as if nothing significant had occurred. A priest came to our house one day to have his water bottle refilled. That pastor's car had broken down on the road near our house and he was out of water. So when he saw our house, he came to drink water from us. He arrived and rang the doorbell. Hearing the doorbell, I opened the gate and the pastor requested me to give him water, explaining that their car had broken down on a neighboring road and they were waiting for a mechanic while their drinking water was out. Hearing this, I called my wife Amelia and offered him a glass of water. Amelia brought water in a glass and when she spotted the priest, she stopped and glanced at him. When the priest gazed at Amelia, he felt the same way. Amelia was staring at the preacher as she stood there awkwardly and without moving. A peculiar pity appeared on her face, as though, seeing the pastor, Amelia remained motionless staring at the priest, as if she is warning him to leave. But when I requested my wife to come forward and give him the water, the priest remarked, If you don't mind, may I come in and get water from them myself? When I heard this, I told him that it was fine and he could come and take it himself. And as the pastor stepped inside, Amelia yelled out loudly, hurled the same glass of water and dashed inside. I approached Amelia and inquired as to what had occurred. Why are you feeling like this? However, Amelia did not respond. When I saw this, I stood up and began giving the priest water. The priest thanked me for refilling his water bottle. He asked, What's the problem, son? You seem quite upset to me. Hearing this, I told him, Father, my younger son Lucas is nowhere to be found. I'm not sure where he is. I've searched, but he's nowhere to be found. Even the police haven't been able to find him yet. When the priest heard this, he looked at my house and stepped outside to tell me, If you come to the church on the surrounding road tomorrow, I will meet you there. In addition, I was reminded that your wife should not know anything about this. I questioned the priest. Father, why shouldn't my wife know this? Likewise, are you concerned about Lucas? Then the priest said to me, Just do what I've said. Come to me tomorrow and I'll tell you everything. And the father went. When I entered the house, Amelia demanded to know what that beggar was saying. I stated nothing. And why was she conversing with me in this manner? In response, Amelia stated that he must be driven away from this residence if he returns. I don't like such people at all. Hearing this made me feel quite odd, but I paid it little mind. The following day, I awoke early and got dressed quickly. Amelia asked me, where are you going to get ready so quickly? On this, I stated that I must meet a new client today to begin my new business. Thus, I must leave early. I left the house and proceeded directly to the church where the pastor had desired to meet me. After arriving at the location, I asked the pastors why they had summoned me there. He informed me that a wicked witch resides in your home. In response, I told him, No, father, everything is going well at my place and money has begun to flow in. Once my son gets here, everything will be fine again. On this point, the priest asked me, when you arrived home from work a few days ago and entered your home, did you notice anything unusual about your wife? Since that day your fortune has begun to improve, have you ever pondered the cause of this unexpected improvement? I responded, No, Father. I have not even considered this. What is wrong with my residence? Father, kindly inform me. Regarding this, the priest informed me that, the woman you consider to be your wife is actually a witch. Your wife died the same day you returned home from work at night, just as you began to find her attractive. When I heard this, I became enraged and told the priest that, if you want money, ask for it, but do not add to my trouble by doing such things. Therefore, the pastor responded, 
All right. Follow your wife tonight and notice what she does. However, remember that if her eyes fall on you, you will perform the same condition as your son. In response, I asked him, Like my son? What happened to my son? On this, the priest instructed me to leave, wait for the night, and then come back to see him the next day. Just then, I receive a call from the police who inform me that they have discovered a child's necklace body in the pond behind my house. Hearing this, I felt as if the ground had shifted beneath my feet. I hurried from there to my house, and when I got there, I couldn't believe what I saw. My wife was crying near the pond, and I was watching her cry from a distance, as if my legs lacked the strength to move ahead. But I moved my legs and began heading in the direction where the corpse was laying. What I witnessed after arriving there, it was as if it sapped the strength from my feet. A body was pulled from the pond and that body was dressed in my son's Lucas's clothes. And of course, that body was my son Lucas. Seeing his physique, it appeared as though someone had extracted all of his blood and drank it. Normally, being in water causes the body to swell, but his body was absolutely dry. At that point, I began to recall what the preacher had said to me in church a while before, and I was convinced of it, even though I didn't want to be. And I began to doubt my wife for the first time. My name is Harrison. And while I was driving away from William's house, a man named Benjamin suddenly pulled out in front of my car on the highway. I slammed on the brakes as soon as I noticed it. Otherwise, I'm not sure what would have occurred. He appeared to be experiencing a tremendous deal of shock when I first saw him. And when I asked him what was wrong, he informed me what happened to his wife and son. As you already know, after watching the second episode, following the priest's revelation that his wife was a witch and had murdered his son. Until he pulled his younger son's headless body from the water behind his house, he had no idea. Then, for the first time, he began to take the priest's words seriously and unwillingly, he began to distrust his wife. On that day, I was sitting in my house sorrowful after performing my son's final rites. My wife was also seated next to me. At that time, I was remembering the words of the pastor while staring at my wife. My wife was watching my eldest daughter's room. When I saw this, my mind was filled with fear because questions had settled in my mind and I was simply sitting there watching one of my children die. I didn't want anything to happen to my other child. I told my wife that, we couldn't keep our daughter in the house any longer. She is not safe here. My doubts about my wife and my faith in the priest's remarks grew stronger after hearing what she told me. Why? My wife asks. Why aren't you able to keep her here? I stated that whatever killed our son may possibly hurt our daughter here, and I don't want to lose another kid of mine. She stated that there is no need to do so because everything will be okay in a matter of days. I asked. What do you mean it's only a matter of days? On this, she became agitated and stated, I mean, in a few days, the police will find that criminal and then we will be safe again. As a father, I was concerned for my child. But as a mother, I did not sense that care in her. When I looked at her, it seemed as if she wanted our daughter to stay in that house at any cost. But I ignored her and took my daughter to my sister's house. 
I also invited my wife to accompany me to my sister's place, but she said nothing and just stood there staring at us. I then informed her that I would be running late and would instead be spending the night at my sister's house. That is the reason I'm asking you to accompany me. She responded that she is fine here. After hearing this, I responded, Okay, I'll arrive tomorrow as early as I can. Today, take care of yourself. I then took my daughter and left from there after stating this. When I was driving with my daughter, my daughter told me, Papa, I don't know why, but I feel unusual discomfort and fear from being with my mother right now. She had been staring at us in a peculiar way for a few days. I asked her, Why do you feel like that, Ava? On this, she stated, Papa, I don't know why, but Mother has begun doing strange things since that day when we got home from school when we felt her more beautiful in the morning. Hearing this from my daughter, I felt quite strange and I quickly questioned her. What strange things is your mother doing? She stated, Mother used to lick us with her tongue as if we were food for her and she was some kind of beast. When we were with her, she kept staring at us which made me feel uneasy. I was terrified of those eyes of hers. Hearing this from my daughter, my faith in the pastor's words grew stronger and instead of leaving my sister's house, I left my daughter with a friend nearby and immediately proceeded to my residence to follow my wife as instructed by the pastor. I parked my car a little further away from the house and strolled carefully towards it. I waited for my wife to leave the house while standing in the bushes some distance from my home. The thought once crossed my mind, would she have left before I arrived or had I not delayed in coming? Therefore, occasionally the pastor's remarks began to ruminate in my thoughts. Just now that I was thinking that, I saw my wife leaving the house. I began to follow her as well. What I witnessed after only a short stroll filled my eyes with terror. I noticed she had transformed into another woman. Her legs were folded and her hair was unkept, and she was screaming extremely loud. And when she was crying, only one thing was said. What if my good prey has escaped from my grasp? I was looking at that dreadful sight, hiding behind the same bushes, when she abruptly turned and glanced back. She sounded as if she heard some bushes move. Looking directly behind her, my entire body was seized with horror because when she looked back, her neck was back, but her entire body was forward and her eyes were bloodshot, as though she was on the lookout for someone. Then a rabbit appeared from the bushes. When she saw the rabbit, she pounced on him and began gnawing on him raw. I was stuck with panic when I saw this scenario, but I gently departed while taking care of myself. And I was thinking of all this when I suddenly appeared on the road in front of your car. Hearing this from Benjamin, my hair stood on end and I realized that this man had been captured by a vast evil power, which is threatening the life of his family. Hearing his state and what had occurred to him now, my mind decided that I would not leave him alone in this war and that I would also assist him in getting out of this crisis. After listening to Benjamin, I told him about myself and vowed to assist him in his situation. Hearing this, Benjamin asked, how would you assist us in all of this? I told him that in this state, I would be unable to tell you anything right now. But yes, I can try to save you from all of these problems. But first, we must wait until daylight. It's late at night and I am unable to take you to your home until we develop a plan for dealing with the demon because it is unsafe to do so. As we waited for morning, I immediately drove Benjamin to the same priest who had advised him of all of these things. When the priest noticed Benjamin there, he replied, Now that you know the truth. When Benjamin heard this, he sobbed and begged the father to pardon him so that he might rescue his family and himself from their current predicament. Benjamin continued by asking, Father, what happened to my wife? Did the same witch kill her as well? No, he replied. Although your wife has already passed away, the witch has taken over her body and plans to sacrifice you and your daughter on the night of the full moon. Hearing this, Benjamin became terrified and began asking the priest, Father, what should we do now? Please, suggest a solution. Don't worry, the priest said. You invite me to dinner today, but keep in mind that your wife should not be made aware of this. Benjamin said, Please come today, 
You both are now my only source of support. Looking at me, the priest inquired, Who is this boy? He is my friend, and he also wants to help me. Thus, he is with me. Don't worry, the priest replied. I will absolutely come. The priest now instructed Benjamin to return to his home and act normal. On this, Benjamin stated, I will do as you say. And I dropped Benjamin off at his place. One thing that bothered me here was that the night of the full moon was tonight, and that witch was going to sacrifice Benjamin today. And perhaps the pastor should not have told Benjamin about this since it would have worried him even more, and then our plan would not be jeopardized. The priest told him that he would arrive at his residence late at night. When Benjamin and his wife were sleeping in the room at night, his wife got up and went outdoors, just like the other night. Benjamin came out of his home after his wife had departed and brought the pastor and me in. The priest began his preparations after arriving. After a while, the priest began to pray some mantras. Amelia came running towards the priest, shouting outside because the priest's prayer had such strength. As soon as Amelia entered the house, she began shouting extremely loud and telling Benjamin in a very frightening voice that, You did not act properly. I will not leave anyone. I'm going to drink everyone's blood today. Her scream was so powerful that we thought the mountain would close our ears. She returned to her previous form because the priest's prayers had caused her so much grief. The priest then told the witch, Satan, calm down. Otherwise, I will immediately send you to hell. When she heard this, she burst out laughing and yelled angrily. You can't hurt me. You too will perish at my hands. And then she went to assassinate Benjamin. As soon as she arrived at Benjamin, the priest sprayed holy water on her, causing her skin to burn. She glared angrily at the priest and yelled, causing the priest to flee and hit the wall. Because of the night of the full moon, she was far more powerful than we realized at the time. When he hit the wall, the priest went temporarily unconscious. As a result, we temporarily lost control of the witch. And now, she laughs at us with bloodshot eyes before slaughtering me. She threw me away with one of her blows as soon as I moved forward to stop her. Now that there was no one between Benjamin and her, she grabbed Benjamin's neck, lifted him up, and burst out laughing. Benjamin was still in the priest's hands, and he was still unconscious. Then she told Benjamin, You know how I killed your son. Listen, I tore his neck with these jaws of mine before swallowing his soft head. After drinking his delicious blood, I dumped his body in the pond behind your house like waste. You all have to die on this day, but he died earlier. He came after me that night and saw me in this form. That's why I killed your son. You want to see your son score? Tell me. Want to see? Watch carefully. She put her hand in her mouth and took out a child's rotten skull and held it in her hand while speaking to Benjamin. Look at your son's head. And as soon as she said that, she burst out laughing. <laughs> When Benjamin saw this, he became angry and began beating her. But it seemed as if his blows had no effect on the witch. Seeing this, I realized that this isn't such a devil. But in order to deal with it, we'll have to use some different tactics. As I previously stated, I am a paranormal investigator. But I am much more than that. My father was a great occultist. And he had given me some things to use in times when we were caught in some supernatural crisis from which we couldn't get out. It was finally time for me to put that thing to use. The unique feature of this locket was that whoever wore it gained such vision and power that he could see things that no ordinary person could see with his own eyes. And he could keep any soul close to him in his body via the locket without having been possessed by that spirit. As a result, the wearer of this locket had unlimited power. This was the first time I used my locket in this manner. First, I held my locket and chanted a mantra taught to me by my father. After that, it was as if a different power began to operate within me. And the moment I opened my eyes, I could see the souls of his wife and child right behind Benjamin, attempting to force him to fight the witch, but their spirits were unable to reach him. 
That is when I used my locket to summon their souls into my body. As soon as I said this, it was as if the locket summoned them and those souls rushed towards me and entered my body through my locket. It was as if a wonderful energy began to flow inside my body as soon as they entered my body. When the witch saw this, she immediately made Benjamin sit on the ground and as soon as she opened her mouth to kill, in the blink of an eye, I made a blow on her, due to which she fell straight and fell outside, breaking the wall of the house. It was astounding to notice my body's strength and agility. I could also sense Benjamin's wife and son's rage at the witch who tried to harm her family. When the witch stood up again, I slammed her to the ground with a kick to the face. She began to scream in agony. Meanwhile, the pastor regained consciousness and began reciting his mantras. Soon, a fire began to burn within that witch. As a result, she began to cry in pain. The priest then questioned, Who are you and who brought you here? The witch claimed that, I had arrived from a nearby deserted graveyard and discovered that his wife had died. Then, I entered her body and waited for the night of the full moon so that I can slaughter them all and drink their blood. The priest then stated that the true home of a devil like you is in hell. And he began intensifying the mantra so that the witch began to burn with smoke and was reduced to ashes within a few minutes. After that witch died, Benjamin's wife and son emerged from my locket and flew to heaven. The priest then placed the ashes in a bottle, carried it with him and buried it in the church grounds so that the witch cannot harm anyone else. Benjamin thanked me once everything was completed. I then told him to take care of himself and his daughter before getting into my car and driving away to my next destination. Hello there. I hope you enjoyed this series. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, please like the video, share it with your friends and family, and help us reach 100,000 subscribers on YouTube because this series cannot continue without your help and love. The more you enjoy this series, the more motivated we will be to continue it. We are confident that you will assist us in reaching our first milestone of 100,000 subscribers for our channel, and without your support, we cannot achieve it. Thank you to everyone who has supported us and shown us so much love. Until then, bye-bye. Stay safe. Hi, I'm Harrison, and by now, you must know that I aspire to be a paranormal investigator. To understand the world of the paranormal, last week, I visited the Maxfield house, and the demon I encountered there was by far the scariest and the strongest one I had to fight. The Maxfield family lives in the outskirts of the town in an old-looking home. When I met them, I got to know that family has only three members, Liz Maxfield and her two daughters, the elder one, Misha, and the younger one, Joe. Mr. Maxfield was a firefighter and he died in one of his operations. Before his death, the family was living in the heart of the town, but to deal with their grief, they decided to move to the quieter part of the town. Hence, they purchased this new home. However, since they moved into this new place, strange things have happened with the members of the family, especially the sensitive Joe. When I entered their property, I noticed a strange heaviness in the atmosphere. I am sensitive to energies, and I must have sensed the evil spirit that resided there. Liz was a hard-working woman. Providing and caring for her two daughters in the absence of her husband was a big thing. The first weird occurrence happened with Liz. When they purchased the home, it was in bad condition and needed a ton of repairs. After performing the repairs, Liz still didn't feel secure in her own home. She decided to install seven CCTV cameras around her home in order to keep an eye on her home. That way, she could be able to monitor the house, even when she was at work, as the control of the CCTV camera was on her phone. In the beginning, it had become a good pastime for Liz to just sit and watch the home. She could see her daughters play in the backyard. She could see them come and go to school. It was a different but exciting experience. One evening, just after sunset, Liz was sitting on her living room sofa, watching Joe play in the backyard through her phone. When suddenly, at the periphery of the screen, she could spot a black hooded figure. 
The cameras were grainy and it was dark outside. Still, the hooded figure was visible through the camera. And not to mention, Joe was playing a few meters away from this hooded figure. Liz ran out the back door, but by the time she reached the backyard, there was no one except Joe. Liz was paranoid, so she got Joe inside and locked all the doors and windows. When she thought about the incident, she thought maybe it was an animal or a malfunction of her camera. Someone other than the three of them couldn't be on the property. At the same time, Misha was upstairs in her room reading when she started to hear tapping sounds on the wall she was resting against. It felt like it came from the other side of the wall. To investigate, she rested her ear against the wall, and as soon as she did, that someone banged on the wall on the other side so loud that Misha stumbled away from the wall. She ripped her bedroom door open and saw her mom on the phone downstairs staring intently at the screen. Her little sister had just walked into her own room a while ago after playing in the backyard. Misha was scared, so she returned to her bed and hid under the covers. A while later, Joe was resting in her room when she heard someone knocking on the door. Thinking it to be her mom or sister, she opened the door to find no one outside. Downstairs, she too could see her mom staring at her phone screen. As soon as she closed the door, there were three loud taps. She knew it wasn't her mom or her sister. This scared Joe as she went under her duvet to hide. Both the sisters had confessed to me that they heard the banging and tapping throughout that night. At one point, both of them managed to fall asleep. The next day, both the sisters mentioned experiencing the same thing. That's why Liz was a bit suspicious. But to calm her daughters down, she said that it's an old house and sometimes when the wind blows, old pipes and wooden panels make weird sounds. No need to worry about it. A few days later, Liz hired a few men to clean the basement, which had piles of stuff the previous owners had left behind. When the men were emptying the basement, one of the workers spotted a big pentagram drawn on the floor of the basement. He informed Liz, and she asked him to just paint over it. She didn't want her daughters to see it. What Liz did not know at the time was the fact that her daughters had discovered several pentagrams all around the property. They were either carved in the trees, painted on the rocks, or drawn in the dirt. To not scare their mom, the girls decided to shut up about it. Now, if you do not know, a pentagram is usually associated with satanic worship. Later that week, when the men returned to do the repairs of the basement, while tearing down drywall, they found a diary. They handed it to Liz. The diary belonged to a woman and it dated back to 1927, the year when the house was built. The diary had countless entries and diagrams of ritualistic sacrifices of animals and humans done in the basement of this house. Liz decided to hide the diary from her daughters and pretend everything was normal. Until one day, when Misha was sick and Liz had to run to the drugstore to get her some medication. By this point, both the girls were pretty scared of being alone in the house. So Liz decided to drop Joe off at her friends and then go to the drugstore, leaving Misha at home alone. Misha was lying on her bed waiting for her mom to return when her closet door started rattling. A foul smell surrounded the room and the atmosphere became thick. Misha immediately knew something was off. She got up from the bed and hid under it. A minute or two later, the doors to her closet opened and a dark human-like figure stepped out. The figure had long hair that brushed the ground as it walked. Misha was terrified and was hiding in a corner below her bed with her hands covering her mouth shut. The figure walked all over her room and then disappeared downstairs. She was relieved that the figure was gone but scared that someone was in her closet all along. Suddenly, the pin drop silence was broken when she heard someone run upstairs. It was the long-haired, dark figure and it stopped right in front of her bed. All it had to do to find Misha was look down. But instead, the figure laid in her bed. She could feel the bed compress over her. A scream was about to rip from her throat when two big sunken eyes were suddenly staring at her. The figure was leaning over the bed, looking below it right at Misha. She couldn't hold back her voice anymore and began screaming. The figure sat on her bed for some time and then walked away into another room. Not long after, Liz returned and heard the screams of Misha coming from upstairs. When she went to her room, she saw her sick daughter crouched under the bed, terrified, screaming, sobbing, and sweating. At that moment, Liz just wanted to leave the home forever, 
but as she was financially so much invested in the house, she couldn't walk away. She felt truly hopeless that when she did some digging, she found me. And here I was, listening to these three ladies narrate their story to me. As soon as I walked into their home, I knew that their home was possessed. But from the description Misha gave, I figured it must be a witch. I decided to stay with the ladies for some time to help them. That night, while I was in the kitchen drinking water, suddenly, all the cabinets opened and the crockery stacked inside flew at me. I was hit by a few dishes and the noise of so many utensils dropping at the same time got all three ladies to the kitchen. Liz helped me out of the mess, while Misha and Joe were terrified. I knew that water had gone over my head, so I decided to confront the witch head on. The evil spirit must have sensed my intentions, as the witch appeared in the hallway. As she approached the living room, the lights began to go off in the house. Liz and the girls were hiding in a corner beside me. I wore my locket and started reciting some mantras. Soon, an ear-piercing scream could be heard from the witch. My prayers were affecting her, and she was on her knees with bloodshot sunken eyes looking right at me. I kept on praying and picked up a cross that was kept on a table nearby. I walked forward with the cross in my hand and the witch began to retreat. It felt like my mantras were working when suddenly something hit my head so hard that I fell a little dizzy. A nearby light bulb had fallen on me and my powers were weakened. I still kept on praying, thinking about the women I had to protect. Next, the witch raised all the fallen utensils and aimed them not at me, but at the two kids. I recited my mantras more loudly, and suddenly, all the utensils flew in the witch's direction. Right there, I could see a spirit of a man helping me protect the Maxfield family. And from the pictures I had seen, I recognized it to be Mr. Maxfield, helping me save the ladies of his family from the demonic witch. With his powers combined with mine, I managed to corner the witch. She was screaming and trying her best to get out of my control, but I tried my hardest. When I was close enough, I touched the cross to the witch's head, which turned her into dust. Finally, the Maxfield family was safe, and I saw Mr. Maxfield leave the home, smiling at his ladies with tears in his eyes. I gathered the remains of the witch and took them to the church where a pastor I knew would dispose of them for me. Now Liz, Misha, and Joe live happily in the house, and I am happy that I was able to help them with my knowledge of the paranormal. Seventeen years. I have been doing this for seventeen bloody years. And in all that time, this particular paranormal case has to be one of the most morbid cases I have ever seen. My name is Harrison Ward, and as you all know, I'm a paranormal investigator. I have helped solve numerous paranormal cases in the past, but the details of the paranormal case you're about to hear is one I'll never forget. It all started on the 12th of October. 2009. I had received a call from a couple in the suburbs. The couple claimed they were experiencing some paranormal disturbances in their home and they wanted to enlist my help to get rid of the abnormal presence that was terrorizing them. I usually don't take jobs like this, as most of the time, the people calling were usually prank callers pulling stupid stunts and since I wasn't there in person like I usually am with these jobs, I couldn't tell if they were being genuine or not, but from the tension and fear I noticed in the man's voice during the call, I knew there was something more to this. So I gave them the benefit of the doubt and I went to check it out. I arrived at the couple's house the very next day and before I knocked on the door, I could already tell something was wrong. I could smell it from the car, but standing in front of their home now, the foul smell was much more potent. If you've ever dabbled in my line of work, you'll know how important it is to have a keen sense of smell because as a paranormal investigator, the first rule they'll ever tell you is Beware the smell of rotting food. That was the signature scent of otherworldly creatures. This odor was quite unique, as while it did bear a similar resemblance to that of human rotten food, its smell was far more potent than normal rotting food. So we could always tell the difference. Everyday normal people usually wouldn't be able to perceive it. But after entering the world of the paranormal, it becomes very easy to pick up. Knowing full well this case was the real deal now, I knocked on the door and got to work. After talking with the couple for a few minutes, 
I had already noticed a lot of odd things about this household. For starters, their names were Don and Gertrude Floyd. Don was in his early 40s and Gertrude was in her late 30s. Their dynamic was in one word, perplexing. As someone would never guess that these two people were a couple that had been married for 12 years. Another thing I found perplexing was how young Don's wife Gertrude looked. Don't get me wrong, I know that most women nowadays look youthful well into their 30s. But for a woman that was 38 years of age, she really looked like she was in her early 20s. I assumed she must have some amazing genes as nothing else really seemed odd about her. And as far as I could tell, she was a nice and well-mannered woman. Don, on the other hand, was very different. The man looked far older than his age and the bags under his eyes told me that he hadn't been getting enough sleep for the past few months. As a paranormal investigator, it was always good to pick up and analyze the clients you're working for as you always get clues from there. And after I was done with my primary analysis, I decided to get on with the case. It took about an hour 30 minutes, but after hearing the paranormal problems the Floyds had been experiencing, I realized that their case was a very bizarre one. At first, the couple told me that in their 12 years of marriage, they haven't been able to have children. I was confused now, as I knew it was fairly common for couples to have problems conceiving children. But what they told me next was shocking, as Gertrude revealed that she had been pregnant six times already. But after eight months, during the final weeks of her pregnancies, all six of her babies died inside her. This was odd, as while I knew many women suffered miscarriages two to three times in their lives, losing your unborn child six times in a row, at the exact same time, and in the exact same manner, was too much to be called a coincidence. The couple stated that, even if it was painful, they had decided to try again, but that's when something disturbing started happening to Don. Don told me that for the past few months, he had been constantly hearing the wails and cries of little infants, and he believes that they are the souls of his dead children who are now calling out to him. Now, I'd been in this business long enough to know when someone was lying. But with one look at Don Floyd, I knew he was telling the truth. I remember looking Don dead in the eyes as he told me through tears. Believe me, Mr. Harrison, I can hear them. I don't know how, but I can hear my babies. They are calling and crying out to me and I can't do anything. I can't do anything to help them. Seeing this man break down before my eyes was hard. His wife Gertrude was also crying now, so I told them, I am truly sorry for the massive loss that both of you have gone through, Mr. and Mrs. Floyd. And while I can't bring your children back, I promise to help and protect you while I get to the bottom of this paranormal experience. After saying that, I proceeded to calm them down before asking them a question that had been on my mind. The question was for Gertrude as I looked at her and said, What about you, Miss Floyd? Do you by any chance also hear these constant wails and cries of infants that your husband Don hears? Gertrude had already stopped crying now, so she looked me in the eyes and said, No, I truly don't hear anything. A thousand thoughts passed through my mind as I heard her answer. I actually assumed that she would be the major one to hear these phantom cries, as she was the children's mother. And as I looked into her eyes, I could tell something was off. After asking Gertrude my question, I looked at Don and asked if we could talk alone. So Gertrude stood up to leave. When she had left, I immediately asked Don how Gertrude had been taking this entire ordeal. Don then said, Well, she's been really hurt by this as every mother would, but she never dwells on the loss too much as she always seems eager for us to try again. I thought after the loss of our fourth child, she would stop trying, but she didn't. She just wanted us to immediately try again when she recovered from the miscarriage. I know she really wants to give birth to our child and it really kills me that no matter how much I try, I can't give her that. When Don was done speaking, I told him, thanks for answering. And while I don't mean to pry, I'd like to ask how she felt about calling and inviting me to your home. Don then took a short pause before saying, well, to be honest, she didn't really want us to do this. And to be totally honest, I really feel like she doesn't believe me when I say I can hear our children's cries. Even when I told her what was going on, she said it was probably just an anxiety attack caused by the recurring loss of our kids. She then said it'll pass soon and there was no need to call a paranormal investigator, but things just got worse and when it didn't eventually pass, I had no other option but to call you without her approval. I thanked Don for answering me truthfully before saying, well, that's all my questions, but before I go, can I look around the house? 
Don quickly agreed as he took me around the house. Everything seemed fine in the house after my inspection, but there was something that caught my attention, and it was the massive tree growing in the backyard. I asked Don if they planted it, and he responded saying, Believe it or not, we actually didn't plant this tree. It's been there since we moved into this house after we got married. It wasn't always this big though. It used to be a very little thing that I wanted to uproot, but all of a sudden it grew into this massive tree. I then asked him, Do you know what type of tree it is and has it ever bore any fruit? Don then replied, I, I actually don't. At first I thought it was an apple or a pear tree, but as time went on I couldn't really tell. The patterns on its leaves are very unique and surprisingly, it doesn't bear any fruit. I had finally gotten everything I needed to know, so I told Don, Well, that would be all, Mr. Floyd. Thank you for explaining everything in detail. I'll see you tomorrow morning to continue this investigation. And with that, I left the Floyd's home. On my way back, I thought about a lot of things. I recalled the moment when I saw the couple break down, and while it was a messed up thought, I couldn't help but feel like Gertrude's tears were fake. I knew she was their mother and the major person who suffered through these incidents, but as I said earlier, I knew when people were being genuine and truthful, and something was really off about her words and her crocodile tears. Even though I felt like this, I didn't want to jump to any conclusions, so I thought about the other odd thing I noticed, and that was the tree. I could smell the stench of rotten food coming from it, so I knew this strange tree had something to do with the paranormal experiences they had been experiencing in their home. And while I didn't know exactly what it was, I was going to make sure I find out the very next day. Once the next day arrived, I went to the Floyd's home. The foul stench of rotting food had increased tenfold now, as I could already smell it from down the street. Whatever thing was terrorizing them had to be very powerful for it to be releasing this kind of potent smell. So just to be on the safe side, I chanted the words of the exorcist robe, as it was a mantra that protected me from demonic and occultic beings. After that, I went into the house and asked the couple to follow me into the backyard. We were all surrounding the tree now, and I brought out a lighter and blessed wood. This blessed wood wasn't just any type of wood, because as the name entailed, it was wood that was doused in holy water before it was dried and blessed by a priest. This type of wood was necessary whenever you wanted to burn objects or things that had been soiled by demons or evil spirits. And as I lit the wood with my lighter, the blue flame sparked to life. Gertrude now had a nervous look on her face as she asked, Excuse me, Mr. Harrison, but what are you going to do with that fire? I then responded with, Well, I'm going to use it to burn the tree. I then saw rage fill Gertrude's eyes as she screamed the words, No, no, I love that tree. You can't burn it. I could see the shocked look on Don's face now as he wondered why his wife was acting like this over a tree, but all my suspicions were finally confirmed. Gertrude had started forcing her husband Don to stop me from burning the tree, and while he didn't want to stop me at first, he was a man who loved his wife, so he told me not to. I then told them that since it was what they wanted, I wouldn't burn the tree, and as Gertrude, who had managed to compose herself, said these words, Thank you, Mr. Harrison. You don't know what this tree means to me. I threw the flame at the base of the tree. The screaming of infants filled the entire backyard as the flame touched the tree. Like acid eating through plastic, the fire burnt its way through the roots of the tree, and when it was done, the sight we saw was ghastly. The fresh bodies of six infants were found at the base of the tree. These babies had no skin, and I could see the roots of the tree had morbidly grown from their heads. Don, who was standing next to me, started to vomit while his wife, Gertrude, fell to her knees. I had seen a lot of horrendous and unspeakable things during my time as a paranormal investigator, but this was too much for me. I held myself from throwing up as I knew I had to compose myself. Don, who had a distraught look on his face, screamed the words, Can someone please tell me what the hell is going on? This was usually one of the hardest parts of this job, and it was telling these families the truth. But I knew I had no other choice. So I looked Don dead in the eyes and I said, I'm very sorry, Don, but your wife, Gertrude, is not who you think she is. From what I can tell, she probably made a bargain with a demonic being and sold the lives of your six infants 
for eternal youth. I've had my suspicions, but this confirmed it. I've seen similar cases like this before, but they have never been this horrible. Unfortunately, this is how these things work, as the major rule when bargaining with demons is simple. Something given, something taken. So youth was given, and the lives of your children were taken. Gertrude, who had now given up on denying these horrendous occultic acts she had been carrying out, started screaming the words. You would never understand, but I had to do it. Don, I had to do it. What am I without my youth? I don't want to be a, a ragged old hag you'll throw to the side once I show some wrinkles. So I did this for us, to save our marriage. We can always have more children, so it was a small price to pay. When she was done screaming, I noticed her husband Don was completely speechless as he just stared at her. This was the second time I had seen him break down, and I didn't blame him because there was only so much a man can take. But before he could say anything, the foul smell of rotten food suddenly filled the backyard. It was far worse than before now, and I couldn't help but throw up. After I had thrown up, I noticed that the tree, which was surprisingly still standing, started to do one of the strangest things I had ever seen. A hole opened up in the middle of its bark, and this tree regurgitated a woman-like humanoid creature I had never seen before. This creature possessed the structure of a female human, but that's where the resemblances stopped, as it bore no mouth or eyes. Its hands also had no fingers, and the creature stared right at Gertrude. As I said, this thing had no mouth, but when it spoke, I could hear its words in my soul as it said, To the one called Gertrude, our bargain has been terminated. I told you that as long as this tree grew and blossomed, so will your youth grow and blossom. I have been cheated, and I've come to take back what is mine. At first, I assumed this thing was a witch, but as I studied its movements and mannerisms, I realized that this creature was something far worse than the usual witch or evil spirit I always handled. I figured it was using a disguise to hide its true form, as high-level demons and spirits usually did that to throw off paranormal investigators and exorcists. Its identity was its power. So I spoke the words from the Scroll of Truth, a mantra that revealed the truth to one's eyes. The mantra annoyed the creature as it started to shriek, and it didn't take long before its skin began to tear off and its true nature was revealed. The sight of this creature sent chills up my spine. The Latin name is Ielequia Varus, and that roughly translates to the one who's greedy or the greedy one. It was a beast that feasted on the flesh of humans, and while it's been known by many names all through the years, it is widely known today as the Wendigo. The creature possessed long horn-like protrusions from its head that looked like antlers. It stood on its hind legs and its face resembled that of an elongated skull. After being a paranormal investigator for all these years, I knew at that moment I was totally out of my league. Wendigos were very hard demonic beasts to kill, but I wasn't going to give up. I started to chant the words of the pure mantra, as it was a chant that banished demons and evil spirits, but before I could even say the words, the Wendigo struck me in my torso. The blow threw me all the way to the wall and I hit my head hard. My vision was blurry now, and I couldn't see much, but I could tell the creature was shrieking in pain. The exorcist robe mantra had worked, and while I didn't take a lot of damage, I would have died without it. I didn't need anyone to tell me that my ribs were broken and I had a bleeding gash on my head. I stood on my feet and started reciting the mantra, but once again, I started to hear the winged dingo's voice in my head as it taunted me, saying, You feeble humans just never learned. I was here before you walked the earth, and I'll be here when you all meet your deaths. You cast me out like I'm any different, when in reality, we are just the same. Because while we may look different, we are both greedy beasts. I ignored the creature's words of temptation as I continued to chant the words of the pure. But the Wendigo continued with, Save your breath. I'm not a low-level being, so those petty chants won't work on me. You have managed to save yourself from death by protecting yourself with the unseen robe. But I will show you just how powerless you are by killing these humans in front of you. When I heard this, I immediately tried to move toward Don to protect him, but my legs gave out. I had fallen to my feet now, and I was coughing blood. 
The creature already had Don in its clutches, and I could hear him screaming for my help. I tried and I tried, but my body couldn't move. I could only sit and watch how the Wendigo morbidly reached into Don's head and gouged out his left eye to eat. Don's screams filled the entire place, and knowing the kind of creatures Wendigos were, I knew exactly what was going to happen next. In the paranormal world, it was known that Wendigos were creatures that picked out and chose the parts of the human body they liked to consume. They started with the eyes before moving toward the intestine, and when they were done, they would tear out and consume the flesh of their victims. And even though I knew this, nothing prepared me for that sight. I watched in horror as Don's right eye was ripped out and swallowed by the beast. I then watched as his stomach was torn open and his intestines were eaten. Don was dead now, but his corpse was mutilated even more as his skin was torn off his body and consumed. And no matter how much I tried, I could do nothing but watch how the man I swore to protect was turned into a sadistic human buffet before my eyes. When the Wendigo was done, it turned its sights on Gertrude. I watched as Gertrude started screaming the words, Please, I can marry another man and give you more infants to consume. Please, just let me go. But her pleas fell on deaf ears as I watched again how her eyes were gouged out, how her intestines were eaten, and how her skin was ripped off her corpse and consumed. When it was finally done, the Wendigo looked directly at me. No words were said as it just stood there and revealed its bloody teeth. At first, I couldn't tell what it was doing, but I soon realized that the creature was mocking me by smiling. And just as it appeared out of the tree, the creature vanished into thin air. I remember lying on the floor as I was still unable to move. I really don't know how long I lay there for. I'm guessing it was probably two hours, but eventually I got the strength to stumble to my car. And as I got in, I cried. I cried and cried until my eyes were sore. I had been doing this for so many years now, but I still couldn't get over the loss of the people I was meant to protect as a paranormal investigator. I knew that the blood of Don, his wife, and his six children were on my hands as I couldn't defeat the creature that had taken their lives. Not all cases had a happy ending as I swore to help and protect him, but in the end, I did nothing but watch him die. It was hard. But this was the path I chose, and even though it wasn't easy, I had to keep moving forward because, at the end of the day, it's just as my father used to say. Such was the life of a paranormal investigator.